I am excited to be preaching uh, this morning, and I was reading this morning in, in uh, Matthew, going through the Gospels, and uh, I came across where John the Baptist speaks of Jesus, and he says, I, I'm not even worthy to carry the sandals of the man who's coming after me. And, and I just thought to myself, wow, that is John the Baptist saying that he's not even worthy to serve Jesus in the capacity of carrying his shoes. Who am I that I get to preach the word of God and to carry his message? And so this morning, it truly is an honor and a privilege to present the word of God to you. And uh, my prayer is that you would receive from the Lord as he speaks to us. Genesis, we're jumping back into Genesis, Genesis chapter 24. How many missed Genesis? We, okay, how many even knew that we were in Genesis earlier this year? How many are still asleep because we've got the white noise gently going on outside? Come on, church, wake up. We are, uh, we are going back to Genesis chapter 24, and I love it. Yep, I know you love it. And I love that we walk through the Bible and we preach through chapters because it forces us to preach on topics that might get kind of uh, just pushed to the side and things. And and so I I very much value that. I appreciate that. And this morning we're going to be talking about how Isaac finds and gets Rebecca at his uh, his wife. And so uh, I've titled this sermon, Oh Becky, You're So Fine. Before there was Mickey, there was Becky, and she was fine, okay? Uh, As you turn to uh, Genesis uh, chapter 24, I thought I'd just give you a couple updates, and it's been a while since I've got to show off my wonderful kids, and so here's a couple pictures. This is Sam. Did some fishing this summer. This next picture, uh, he loves dill pickles. We're at the the uh, um, I Cubs game, and and he's like, "Can I have a pickle?" And I really had a hard time paying three dollars for a pickle, but I did it because he's worth it. Here's our girls. They uh, made these rainbow bands and beads. And they worked hard all week. It was, this is a, a parenting hack. So if you've got young girls and they tend to um, disagree, not fight, disagree or get in each other's hairs, uh, let them join the Junior Entrepreneur Program. And uh, they were at the Grimes Farmer's Market. And they made rubber band bracelets. And they sold them for 50 cents. And it kept them out of each other's hair all week long. And they made $39. So praise the Lord. <laughs> That was a parenting win on Elizabeth. Uh, this is Paisley. She did some fishing. Holding, I was proud of her for holding that fish. She's next to this llama here. Uh, she loves animals. This llama is an unfriendly llama, but she has a, a gift with animals. I, I, I kid you not, she's just so patient. This is Essie, and uh, she's doing some painting at home. She's five. Uh, Paisley's six. Sam's eight. And uh, this next one, she's with a llama. She's loving it and uh, a lot of fun. And then this is Sam at the llama's place, totally disinterested, reading a book. <laughs> and uh, if I could just sum up Sam, that, that's him. He's awesome. And uh, so that's just a little bit about my family. And uh, I'm sure if you're a parent or you've been a parent, there's times where you wish you could just push pause on time. And you just slow it down and just rewind it and just... I'm trying to eke out every moment with my children, and Elizabeth and I are doing our very best to just pour into our kids, you know, pour into them the wisdom that we've gained, whether that be through life's circumstances or whether that's through our parents and what we've learned from them or different people that have poured into us, and we're trying to intentionally pour as much wisdom and into them and guide them on what scriptures describe as being the narrow path. And, and it's our, our uh, goal to do that with our children. We're doing our best, but we need the Lord's grace and we need the Lord's mercy in our endeavors. And I'd just ask you this morning, what, what are you, is most important that you are passing down to your children? What's most important that you are passing down to your grandchildren? Now, you might say, well, this, this sermon doesn't apply to me. I'm not married. I don't have kids. Well, what are you passing down to your best friend or to a sibling or to whoever it might be in, that you're in relationship? What are the things that, that are important to you? And if you don't know the answer of, of what you're passing down, maybe ask this. What do most of your conversations revolve around? Because if they revolve around the fun activities that you do, you might be passing down this mindset that leisure and play is more important than God. 
In your prayers, as you pray for your family, as you pray for your friends, are you praying for protection and provision and, and uh, blessings? Or are you praying for holiness and obedience and a sensitivity to his word? What are you passing down to those whom you love? There's a lot to be learned in today's text and uh, I, I want to just, um, we'll get there in just a moment, but I want to pray. And this is my prayer this morning, is that as we look to the scripture, as we are challenged by God's word, that we would also be reminded of the grace of Jesus Christ. And that if you're sitting here today, and as I begin to speak what the Lord has placed on my heart, and you begin to feel guilt or shame or the, the what-ifs or the I wish I would haves uh, in, in the past, I would just encourage us all to remember the grace, that there is grace from Jesus, there is mercy from Jesus, and that person that saves your life, Jesus Christ, is here and he's with you and he will help you in the coming weeks, in the coming months. So I, before we even read, uh, could we just, just go before the Lord? Jesus, I, I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that you are with us, that you are for us, and not only that, that you are in us. And so I pray this morning as I share this word that you'd continue to bring about a holy conviction in my life and the way that I'm leading those around me. And, and uh, I, I pray, God, that you would continue to speak, that this word would not just be uh, man's words, but this would be a Holy Spirit quickened, anointed um, message, Lord. And I realize and completely depend on you, Jesus. And so I ask for your help. I ask for your strength. Would you speak to us? In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Genesis 24, verse 1. And uh, you can follow along on uh, your Bibles. Man, we got double, double exciting for the word of God this morning. Okay. Abraham was now very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. And he said to the senior servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, Put your hand under my thigh. Now, I'm grateful that we no longer do this in making covenants. Anybody else thankful that when you go into a business agreement or anything else, you don't have to say, okay, buddy, lift it up. Come here. I'm coming for you. You know, like, that's just an awkward thing of covenant. I'm glad that we no longer touch your thighs. If you come and touch my thigh, I will slap you. <laughs> Put your hand under my thigh, he tells his servant, Eliezer. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I'm living, but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. The servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the, to, to the country you came from? And Abraham responds, make sure that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land and who spoke to me and promised me on an oath, saying to your offspring, I will give this land and he will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son from there. If the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under his thigh of his master Abraham, and he swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Verse 10. Then the servant, who we know is Eliezer, left, taking with him ten of his master's camels loaded with all kinds of good things from his master. And he set out for Aram Naharim and made his way to the town of Nahor. He had the camels kneel down near the wall, the, near the well outside the town. And it was towards evening, the time the women go out to draw water. Now, to put this into modern day uh, just terminology, he knew where the filling station was. So if Eliezer was going and finding a wife, he would go to Starbucks in Target because he knew that the women would be coming there to draw water or coffee or whatever. So, verse 12. Then he, this is the servant, he prayed. And I want you to see how specific of a prayer this is. And I would encourage us all, let's, let's begin to pray specific things so that God would receive maximum, maximum glory. 
that we'd be able to say, man, this isn't just like an idea that I gave the Lord. This is the Lord coming through. This is amazing. This is who it is. So he prayed, Lord, God of my master Abraham, make me successful today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring. I'm standing at Starbucks. And the daughters of the townspeople who are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a young woman, please let down your jar that I may have a drink. And she says, drink and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one that you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. And before he had finished praying, Rebecca, turn to your neighbor and say, oh, Becky. <laughs> Rebecca came out with her jar on her shoulder. And she was the daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abraham's brother, Nahor. So in other words, this is Abraham's great niece, Rebecca. You guys understand that? This is a great niece. Now, I really struggled with wanting to read this entire chapter, but it's 66 verses. It is very good. So your homework this afternoon is to go and continue to read throughout chapter 24 and read exactly what happens and you see the, the Lord's hand and some other things. Um, but but I, I, I didn't want to spend 10 minutes reading 66 verses. And so uh, I, that's your homework assignment. And if you don't hear anything else, the rest of the sermon, I, I want you to hear this this morning. This is kind of the main point, is who you marry matters. Who you marry matters. And just by uh, the, the judging, uh, just the room right now, and just kind of seeing the response, when I said that, I can tell that most of you would agree to that statement. You understand the importance of who you marry is a big decision. And let, me, let me rephrase this uh, for other people in the room. Who your children marry matters. Who your grandchildren marry matters. Who your siblings, who your best friend, whoever it is in your life whom you love, who they marry matters. Who you marry is the second most important decision that you'll make in your life right behind following Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And why does it matter? Because who you become one with can drastically change the direction of your life. How many just by a show of hands would say that you probably wouldn't be where you're at today in church on a Sunday if it weren't for the influence of your spouse? Just honesty, right? Yeah, I praise God for those hands. I praise God that your spouse was a part of your testimony, but I wanna let you know that your story is a minority story. Just by a show of hands, how many would say that you have watched someone walk away from their faith in Jesus Christ and walk away from their faith and it coincides with the time that they started dating someone or they started, uh, they got married or anything? Raise your hand if you know someone that has walked away. Raise it high. All right, why is that? It's because who you marry matters. Abraham knew this and he lived by this conviction. In verse one, it says in our text, it says that Abraham was now very old. Say, help me, Jesus, if you identify with Abraham this morning. Come on, go ahead, be honest. I see some hands up there. <laughs> Abraham was now very old, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. That means that he was blessed financially, he's blessed relationally, he's blessed spiritually. He was blessed in every way. But at the end of Abraham's life, it wasn't Abraham's main ambition to pass on his wealth. He's not passing on his wealth. He's not passing on the wisdom that God has blessed him with. It's not him passing down uh, any earthly blessing. His main concern at the end of his blessed life is for what? For his bloodline to know Yahweh, to serve Yahweh, to honor Yahweh, and to become holy and walk in the way of holiness. He makes this covenant with his, his servant, Eliezer, and he makes him swear, like, do not get a wife for Isaac anywhere but my home country. In other words, don't go to Canaan where they worship false gods that could lead my son astray. But go to my homeland where they already know of Yahweh, where they already are, are, are in relationship with Yahweh. That is where uh, 
Abraham's most important priority at the end of his life was making sure that his bloodline was going to follow uh, Yahweh, to follow God. I don't believe that anyone here would disagree with the main point this morning of who you marry matters, but I'm, I'm afraid that our lives often don't align with the convictions that we hold true in our hearts. The Lord brought conviction to my heart this week as I was preparing, and, and he began to identify some things. It's like, man, if you really believe, Austin, that who you marry matters, then why aren't you praying every day for your son and your daughter's potential spouse should they get married, right? Like my conviction of believing that who you marry matters needs to be followed up with action. And, and, and I, I confess to you, it's not that I've never prayed for you know, my future son-in-law or my future daughter-in-laws, Lord willing, that they get married and that's what they choose, but I, I need to, to really live by this. And I would, I would ask you this morning, what, what about your loved ones? Are you communicating and passing down what truly is most important in this life, which is to follow God? It's not a pursuit of happiness. It's the pursuit of holiness. It's, it's not just this pursuit um, of, of finding the American dream. It's, it's following God's purpose and plan for your life. Are you praying for your child or your grandchild or your niece or your nephew or maybe for your very own future spouse? Are you seeking God's counsel and guidance in your search? God, help us. Help us to live by our convictions. We didn't read this uh, in our, our passage today, but later on in the story, Rebecca's mother and brother give permission for Rebecca to go back to Abraham's uh, area and marry Isaac. Okay, uh, this is a formality that we, we still do today. We go to the father of the bride and we ask for permission. Now, in scripture, it doesn't say that um, Eliezer, the, the servant, went to the father. And so we, we kind of assume, and most theologians believe, that Rebecca's dad was probably dead. And so Laban, her brother, becomes the patriarch. He becomes kind of the man of the household. And so Eliezer goes to uh, Rebecca's mother and her brother and and presents his case as to why they should be getting married, and then they give permission and they give consent. And, and like I said, this is a formality that we, we still do, and I'm guessing that you share a similar story that I do. Before I asked Elizabeth to uh, become my, my wife, I, I went to her parents, and, and we had conversations. Anybody have that conversation, that talk? Anybody just dead, like, set scared, like, shaking in your boots before you had that? Pastor Jeff was, right? Okay. I, I, I remember going and, and having conversations with Dan and Krista and then eventually getting to the point, you know, will you give your daughter's hand in, in, in marriage? And I think that this is something that is good. I think that this is something that's needed. We need godly counsel. We need godly wisdom. And you as a, a single person should want and desire the approval and the blessing of your parents. You, you should be listening to that. But I see a trend that is concerning in today's culture where parents nowadays are more concerned with their child's happiness than they are their holiness. And I, and I wonder just how many parents would have the courage, if prompted by the Holy Spirit, to tell a suitor no. I, have you ever been a part of a conversation that goes something like this? You know, I, 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 he, he treats her really well, um, and, and she's happy, uh, I just wish that they would, they, would, they would come around church more often. I, I wish that they would kind of make God a little bit more of a priority in, in this moment. But I, I'm just glad that, that she found someone that can make them happy, right? Have you ever heard conversations like that? In, in the same breath, it's like justifying their lack of commitment to the Lord is, is justified because they're happy. And it's made okay because of happiness. Abraham wasn't worried about Isaac's happiness. He was worried about his holiness. 
Are you and Father Abe on the same page this morning? And like I said, I know that this might bend a little bit more towards parents and grandparents, but I believe there are people in the room that have best friends or close acquaintances or coworkers that God has placed you in their lives and, and you're more concerned or maybe the Lord is kind of stirring in your heart like, man, uh, you're seeing them go down this path. You're seeing them flirt with the Canaanites. You're, you're seeing them in, in, in a, a way that is not going to lead them to the way of everlasting life. Are you willing to speak up? A truth that I've come to realize is that silence is often interpreted as approval. Silence is often interpreted as approval. If you're a parent and you are not speaking to the way your children are dressing or the music that they're listening to, or the movies that they're watching, or the people they're running around with, or the language that they're using, or the people that they eventually date, what your children are hearing is all is good. All is well in our household. It's totally fine, it's permissible. It's good, mom and dad are good with it. They didn't say anything about the way I look. They didn't say anything about this movie that I'm going to. They didn't say anything about the crowd I'm running with. They didn't say anything about my boyfriend. They didn't say anything about my girlfriend. They interpret silence as approval. If you're a person's best friend and you're not speaking up, your best friend is interpreting that as approval. I think a lot of people feel like they don't have room to talk. Anybody ever been there? Like, who am I? Who am I to, to, you know, just address this? And I think it's because we're not perfect. We make mistakes. But those are lies from Satan. And you need to tell him to shut up and go back to hell because he is the father of all lies and he is wanting to derail your friend, your child, your grandchild. And you need to tell him like, listen, I am not perfect, but that doesn't mean that my mouth is shut because God works through imperfect vessels at all time. We need to have in the church this mutual understanding that even though I'm not perfect as your pastor and you're not perfect in, in, in whatever realm, that I can still receive truth from an imperfect vessel. And, and we can't be intimidated or shamed into keeping our mouth shut. And that's why we, we need to be bold. And, and, and bold not in the sense where we're just going around and being truth tellers. Because you have to earn the right to be heard. Uh, oftentimes it's not the truth. I, I want everybody to hear this. It's not the truth that is offensive. It's the person giving it that is offensive. You hear what I'm saying? And, and so you as a parent, as a grandparent, as a best friend, as an aunt, as an uncle, as a sibling, we need to be sensitive to the spirit of God and, and, and present truth in a loving manner, but also in a firm manner and not be afraid of that. And, and we need to be able to receive that truth in a spirit of, of humility. I, I run towards people who will tell me the truth. In fact, I, this is something that I have to work on in my own heart, but I actually struggle liking people who won't tell me the truth. If I know that they're just trying to be kind and they're just kind of beating around the bush and they're not really telling me exactly what they think and I hear otherwise, I can't trust them. Anybody else just kind of struggle with that? I, and, and there's other people who's like, well, and, and this is where I struggle with it because I realize I'm wrong in that because there are people who are not telling me because they love me or, you know, it's, it's like this, this perversion of the reason of why they're not telling me. It's like, I don't want to hurt their feelings. And so it's out of their heart that they're not being truthful with me, but they don't realize that that's not helpful. And so I, I have to trust that person's heart and not just hold it against them and then just push them out of my life. That was not in my notes, but I, I do run towards people who tell me the truth. Galatians 6.1 says that a, if a brother is caught in sin, 
that we are to gently restore them. And be careful lest we not be caught in that temptation. We must earn that right to be heard, but we're doing it gently. Are you a truth speaker in love, in grace, with restoration in mind? Gently speaking truth, but firmly upon the truth of the Lord. This, this might be an unpopular opinion, and you're welcome to disagree with me and be wrong. Uh, but, <laughs> but I believe that every person should have someone that you trust more than your emotions. I believe that every person should have one person in their life that you trust more than your emotions. Why? Because emotions deceive. Emotions, how, how many have ever like been caught into a pyramid scheme, right? Oh, I'm gonna be rich, woo hoo hoo! You know? How, how, many, how many have ever uh, made an emotional decision and then later come to realize, man, that was not a, a, a wise decision, that was an emotional decision? Right in, in, in the context of love and marriage, um, we, we, we make these decisions that are, are uh, emotional, but how many would be honest this morning, you've been married 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 or 60 years, and you realize that emotions cool off, and there has to be some foundation as to why you made the decision in the first place to marry this individual. How many understand what I'm saying, Right? There, there's truth in that. And so we have to find someone that you can trust more than what your emotions tell. Now, there are a few prerequisites to finding this person. This person needs to be in a long-standing relationship with you. Someone that has proven themselves to be a truth speaker in your life. Someone that has proven themselves to, to uh, have your best interest in mind. Who is the person that is going to you and constantly saying, I, I, I'm concerned for you. I'm, I'm, I'm nervous about this. That is the person who cares and has your best interest in mind. This person has to be godly. This person has to be a person of prayer. This person has to be a, a, a person that there's relationship. They've earned that right to speak into your life. You have to trust this person fully. And for me, that person was my dad. Before I asked Elizabeth, Elizabeth, would you stand up? So a lot of people, I know, she hates that. This is my wife, Elizabeth. Um, and uh, uh, she's oftentimes in the 11 o'clock, but today uh, she's here. Yeah, you can clap for her, sure, why not? <laughs> but uh, I remember, for me, this person that I trust more than my emotions was my dad. And, and I remember at 22 years of age, going to my dad and, and saying, hey, I, I, I want to ask Elizabeth to, to marry me. What do you think? And in that moment, had he told me that marrying Elizabeth would have been a bad decision or to pause or to wait or to any, anything that would discourage that relationship, I would have ended the relationship based upon what he saw and not about what I felt. Now, a lot of you are looking at me like, boy, you crazy, right? Why? Because I'm going to do what I want to do is most people's reality. But I remember laying, uh, you know, on the sofa, my dad talking to me and, and, and he began to list out and he, he knew Elizabeth. She worked at the church for five years and so they knew each other and, and began to list out these different things. And then at the end of it, he said, Austin, to be quite honest, I don't think you can do any better than Elizabeth. <laughs> I said, done. <laughs> Okay, but had he, had he said, I don't think Elizabeth is the one for, for you, I, I would have ended it. Why? Because he's spoken truth to me before, because there's, he's earned that right as my father. He is godly. He's a person of prayer. I know intellectually and I've seen through history that he has my best interest in mind and I know that he's not gonna tell me and warn me of something unless he really feels strongly about that. I want, uh, want first, one, you should be seeking a person like that, but, but two, most people won't hear that because you don't walk in enough, people don't walk in enough humility to receive truth when it's 
We, we begin to throw up. As I was talking about earlier, like, let's commit to speaking truth as we're both walking out our salvation and we're impure vessels. Most people throw up the, the, the card, well, don't judge lest you be judged, right? Like, who are, who are you to tell me? You weren't perfect. You were divorced, Dad. You were divorced, Mom. You, you, you made this mistake. You did that. Instead of just receiving that with the spirit of humility and saying, you know what, I'm going to take this before the Lord in prayer. I'm going to test it and I'm going to ask and seek God. Most people are, one, afraid to, to speak truth in a firm yet loving way. But two, most people don't walk in enough humility to receive hard truths. How many would commit this morning to being a person who will gently restore those who you love? Who, who will commit to speaking truth in love so that who you love will walk in holiness rather than in happiness. And how many would say, I, I commit to receiving truth even if it comes through an imperfect vessel. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Right. I, I, I thank God for these hands and, and I, I wanna leave you uh, with a list of 10 questions that are, are good questions to start with. And these are practical questions um, that, that you should be asking if you're in, in search of a spouse, if your child or your grandchild or your best friend, your aunt or uncle, go ahead and throw them up uh, on the screen. And, and these, are, these are 10 questions. And the, the first is this, are you spiritually on the same page? Right, like scripture is very clear you have to be on the same page spiritually. You have to be equally yoked. Now, this is, might be a little bit of an unpopular teaching, but we as Assembly of God who believes the full Pentecostal, full gospel, it's my opinion, and, and please hear my heart in this, that we should not be maybe looking into a spouse who is Catholic now, I'm not saying anything against the Catholics, but I am saying that there is going, there's major differences theologically that is going to arise in your, your, your marriage that you're, you're gonna have to go one way or the other, right? And, and, and so we need to be on the same page. And I'm, I'm not, like I said, don't hear me. I'm not speaking against uh, Catholics or anything like that. I, I'm just saying that we need to make sure that we are on the same page spiritually. Second question, what does their personal devotional life look like? If you, if you don't see their personal devotional life, you prob they probably don't have it. Do, do they bring up the Lord in conversation when you're talking with them? And, and, and this is for, like I said, parents, grandparents. When that suitor is over and you're doing family dinner and you're there with your daughter and, and her boyfriend, like, is he bringing up the Lord in conversations or is all about his plans and his way and, and his desires? Are they faithfully committed to a local body of believers? Are they already plugged into a church? Are they already bought into the institution that Jesus Christ himself founded, the bride of Christ? How do they treat old people, babies, and pets? Why? Because those oftentimes are the most vulnerable people in our society, right? If they're slapping their dog around, it's probably not a good sign. If, if they're super impatient with the people who require the most patience, babies, I'm sorry, older people, old people at times. Oh, trust me, I've gone on vacations with my parents. It, it requires patience, okay? <laughs> How are they treating those people? Do they have an addiction to pornography? When was the last time they looked at it? What is their family like? How many know that you don't just marry an individual, you marry a family? Now, I, I, wanna, I wanna expand upon this. Like, right, if someone comes from a broken home and their parents are split, or it's just complete dysfunction, that doesn't mean that God's grace can't reach down and snatch them out and they're not worthy of, of being uh, you know, your son-in-law or your daughter-in-law or whatever it is, right? God can work through dysfunction and he does. But there is wisdom in having conversations and understanding and knowing that you're not just marrying an individual, you're gonna be marrying into some of that drama. And the tendencies and the way that their parents handle conflict often come in, in the way that 
that individual will handle conflict. The, the, the struggles, all of these things, how do they handle their, their finances? Do they handle their finances well? Or are they constantly just spending, spending, spending? Are they in the newest, biggest home? Do they constantly have a new vehicle every, every 18 months and they're just constantly going like this? How do they handle conflict? Conflict resolution. Most people stink at it. Are, are they doing it biblically or do they run from it or do they blow up and they get mad? Do, are they passive about it? These are, these are questions to ask and is there anything that you would change about them right now? Like, like it, it, missionary dating doesn't work. It, it doesn't. Who you marry now in this moment, Pastor Jeff taught me this from the hundred weddings I've watched Pastor Jeff do, right? But he says, um, or maybe it was, I think I'll give you the credit today, okay? So that sounds good. But he said, if, if you're not happy with the person that you are marrying today, and you're not just 100% content that if they never change another day in their life, then you shouldn't be marrying that person. We can't wait for someone and, and just have this pipe dream of, oh, well, they'll settle down. They'll get it right eventually. We all get it right eventually. Listen, your story might not be their story. Just because you walked through a season of prodigal and you walked through a dormant season, that doesn't mean that they are going to. We as Christians need to speak up. Why? Because the direction of someone's life is more important than the happiness of their life. Will we commit to speaking love and truth? Will we commit to, to having those hard conversations and we, will we humble ourselves to receive them in all fashions? Now, I, I, I started off talking about this grace, but maybe you've been sitting through this sermon and you're feeling all sorts of guilt because you have, haven't made the wisest decision. Maybe you've been remarried once or twice or even three times. Maybe uh, you felt this pause in your heart when your son-in-law asked for permission for your daughter's hand in marriage and you didn't want to rock the boat and, and now you're, you're left with a situation that is less than ideal. Can I just redirect your attention this morning to the cross of Jesus Christ and I want you to hear me that there is grace for you. There is grace for you. But it's important to know that grace doesn't cancel the consequences of our actions. Grace doesn't cancel the consequences of our decisions. People often confuse mercy and grace, right? Mercy is not giving us something that is deserved. So in God's mercy, uh, scripture says that we have all fallen short, we have sinned, we have missed the mark of God's holiness, and because we have sinned, because we don't meet up to God's requirements of holiness, that we deserve hell and we deserve eternal separation of God. God's mercy is not giving us what we deserve, which is death. Not giving us what we deserve, which is separation from Him. God's grace is giving us something that we don't deserve. Grace is giving you eternal life when you deserve death. Grace is giving you, hear me, giving you the strength to walk through the circumstances of life even if you're the reason why you're in those circumstances. That's God's grace. God's grace is saying, I am with you always until the ends of the earth. That is God's grace. And so this morning, Grace doesn't cancel the consequences of your decisions, but grace, the person of Jesus Christ, the power word, grace is with you and upon you if you'll turn your eyes to Jesus. Our heavenly father is more concerned about the condition of your heart than he is about the mistake that you once made. And so would your heart be sensitive towards him? Would it be turned towards him? Find God's mercy and find God's grace. Would you stand with me? In just a moment, I'm gonna call people forward. And if you have any prayer requests, anything where you need grace, maybe you're facing a surgery this week, maybe you've got something in your life where you just need the strength of God to come in an undeserved way, just receive grace from, I'm gonna call you forward. But with every eye closed and head bowed, 
I, I, I want to just ask a few questions. If you're here this morning and you need to forgive yourself for a mistake that you've made in the past, you're feeling regret or you've been silent and your voice has been silenced or maybe you've ignored advice and, and, and you're like, I need forgiveness in, in this moment and I need uh, to forgive myself. Would you just raise your hand and say, I, I could really afford to forgive myself. Yeah, there's a lot of hands. Yeah, yeah. And this morning, if you need grace in the wake of the consequences that you're living in, you're in a season where you need God's wisdom, where you need his strength, let me just encourage you. Scripture says that there is no end to his wisdom and there is no end to his strength. Those who are weak will be made strong and those who need wisdom, all we have to do is ask. So if you say, I just need God's grace as I walk out some of these consequences, some of these things in my life, would you just raise your hand? Yes, God sees that. God wants to fill you. He wants to pull you in this morning. How many would say, I commit to speaking truth and love. I'm no longer going to remain silent. Would you raise your hand and say, grandparents, parents, siblings, best friends, you commit to receiving truth and humility in this morning that you realize that you've been discounting truth, the truth of God that's been presented to you through unclean vessels, imperfect vessels in this morning. Say, I'm going to receive truth even if it comes from a donkey. You just raise your hand this morning and say, I, I, need, I need that truth. And last and not least, I'm about ready to call you forward as we sing this song, Build My Life, as we declare this. If you're not living with Christ as Lord of your life and you need forgiveness, you need that mercy, you need that grace, you need forgiveness, you, you repent of your sins, you admit your wrongdoing, and this morning you say, I want to follow Christ. I realize that he has not been the center of my household. He's not been the, the king of my heart. That uh, as we used to sing the song of old, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And you say, I'm coming back to him or for the first time I'm placing my trust in him. Would you just raise your hand and look at me? I want to pray for you this morning. Is there anyone here that would say, I need the grace of Jesus Christ to save me? Yeah. Yes. Jesus, I pray, God, in, this, in these moments right now that, that your Holy Spirit would just begin to pour out on us and that we would experience the grace that comes only from you. I pray for anyone who is dealing with a guilt, uh, uh, past shame, condemnation, that there is no condemnation for those who are found in Christ Jesus. So this morning we place ourselves in you, our true vine, the source of life. And, and I pray God that moving forward, this would be a church that where iron sharpens iron, where we work out our salvation together, God, not because of works lest any man boast, but, but with fear and trembling, God, taking your word as, as truth. And so Jesus, would you extend your grace? In your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to come forward. If you have a need of any kind, I know we've got some surgeries. And if you raise your hand, you say, I just need grace in uh, the way my parents, my adult children, different things. We want to pray for you, but we're going to sing this song. I will build my life upon your love. And let's make this our declaration as you come forward. We'll be praying.